Once we have all our SNP data, how can we use it to improve the trees we'd built with STR tests? Do SNP and STR data work well together, or are they like apples and pears? This is the third and last part of a presentation that was originally given at the recent Who Do You Think You Are live event in Birmingham in April 2016, re-recorded with a few new or revised slides. Part 1 covered the basics of SNP testing, and Part 2 examined some more advanced issues surrounding next-generation sequencing tests. This final part will look at how SNP data can be fused with older STR data and genealogy research to build more effective descent trees. So here's a familiar looking STR matrix from a Cummings surname group with roots in Ulster and Western Scotland. The mismatches are coloured and scattered around, so this variation now rearranges them to pick out the signature STRs for the lineage in pink and the mismatching values in the yellow highlights. A number of these mismatches look shared in a way that could make them good markers of sub-branches. Here are a few good-looking possibilities. But there are also some mismatches shared by two testers that don't look as if they can be in the same branch which can confuse the issue, like this here, where it's not clear whether the 11 or the 16 is a potential branch marker, but it can't be both. It looks as if there must be a parallel mutation, that is, one that occurs twice on separate occasions. But which one is it? The two 30s on the left here are another likely case, and these two 12s certainly appeared at different times. This is sometimes called convergence, or the same STR value appearing at different times or from different directions. So here is one of the big dilemmas in using STRs. How far can we use seemingly similar mutations to build branches in our lineage tree? Or how can we spot parallel mutations or convergence? And because STRs are relatively volatile, there's also the problem of invisible back mutations that we never see at all, when a marker mutates up and then back down again, affecting our time to common ancestor estimates or masking branches in a tree that we will never see. Well, this is where SNP testing comes into its own. Because we can use SNPs to identify branches of a tree and then sort the STRs against the groupings made by SNPs. So here we see uh, some SNPs which have been identified by testing, the ones marked in green. And here we can see how these two cases of 30 fall into two different SNP based subgroups. And so we are right to suspect that these are parallel mutations to 30 at different times. So, with SNPs we can build a backbone to our tree and then use STRs as a further level of mutation to bring finer distinction to our branching structure. Signs of convergence can also appear in matching lists for you or your project members. This is a matches list from a member of the Kemp family from Cavan. And while we see lots of Kemps, there are also several people named Jacobs there in the mix, and also a number named Cummings or Cummins, spread around the matches, including Mr Kemp's closest match, ahead of all the other Kemps. So what's going on here? Are these all one genetic family, with a common ancestor inside the surname era? Have there been some later surname changes, or NPEs? Or are these three separate surname lineages which have converged onto each other but which do not share a common ancestor since the adoption of surnames? SDRs cannot really answer these questions. They can give us some clues but no definitive answer. So STRs do give us some tree building options. And there are utilities and methods around for drawing them here is one representation of the Cummings lineage from slide 2, using Robert Barber's system for drawing an STR branching tree. 
This is a useful exercise as it helps pick out those STRs that can be useful branch markers. Many project admins will also be familiar with Fluxus software, which generates networks, which are like networks of mini trees from your STR matrix. This is a Fluxus network for the same Cummings data, 67 marker data only. And the data was prepared using Dean McGee's utility for analyzing STR marker sets. As you can see, this looks very different to the previous barber tree. But it does also pick out STRs that might sit at the branching nodes of a tree. But it is a network, not a tree. And in fact, there are several possible trees that could be compatible with this. Here is one possible tree, picked out in blue. And here is another one. So, we're getting somewhere, but most project admins will understand the frustrations of trying to create a logical tree from an STR matrix. So, can SNPs get us past that and help us create more definitive trees for our surname lineages? Here's an example, again using our Cummings friends, as they have now undertaken no fewer than nine big Y tests and one SNP panel. And this is the result. This is a SNP based tree. Now we do have a very clear descent tree here, especially for the six kits on the left, where we can see some real hierarchy appearing there in the structure, based on shared SNPs within this group. But the four on the right lack that, as all of them seem to descend directly off the distant common ancestor. And this is one issue with SNP based trees. When you find shared SNPs, they are distinctive and will confirm the line. But they lack a degree of fine resolution, as they are estimated to occur only every 140 years-ish in the big Y tested regions. So we need STRs too, to bring in that extra degree of resolution. And bringing in any genealogical information you have could make an even more accurate working tree for your lineage. So just to remind us what that earlier STR-based tree looked like and compare it with a SNP tree, they're capturing the same group in different ways. So how can we bring all this together? Using SNPs, STRs, and the known genealogy. Let's have a go then at building the fullest tree we can for the Cummings, fusing all this data. So first we bring in the SNP structure we established through the SNP tests to give us the backbone of the tree. This Cummings lineage is an R1A subclade marked by SNP YP984, which appears to be a SNP of either Irish or Scottish origin. And these SNPs then are immediately underneath this subclade marker. We'll bring in the testers who SNP tested here at the bottom. And up top, we see those key STRs that we can use in this tree. This is only the set of branch marking STRs. We're not going to use any mutations that are private to one individual here. And so now we bring down a key off modal STR that all the Cummings have, which is a rare three step mutation of DYS464A from 12 to 15 and seems to mark the whole family along with those top SNPs. And we can also add some major branches marked by STRs. These now group some of those lines that seem to come directly off the top block in the SNP only tree on the last slide, and some of them also correlate with SNP defined lines. Now, some people may cavil slightly at this one, marking a branch by the volatile CDY marker, but it does appear to be marking this particular branch consistently so far. And now we can bring off this long line, direct from the top, that has no shared markers with any of the others. And we can add in other branches defined by SNPs and shared STRs. And here's our first NPE.
And here now one of our dilemmas. This is the case of the 16 or 11 mutation from slide 2. And so this tester, who has quite a recent um, earliest known ancestor as well, could attach to either of these two lines. So adding in some more branches. And we see the second NPE fitting in here. And very recently a breakthrough was made with a new tester who took the SNP pack test, but also came with a well-developed genealogy marked here, but allowed us to settle the red lines. So this ancestor was found to fit into the genealogy of the new tester. So allowing us to link him into this line, thus resolving the dilemma. And showing that the 16 mutation must have happened for a second time in this line. And so it is the parallel mutation. The genealogy helped us to crack this along with some single SNP tests on a couple of those coming SNPs there in the middle, giving us a robust Cummings descent tree, showing us where the branching must have happened before the earliest known genealogical evidence from about 1720. And as more Cummings test, we can now build them onto this tree as well. So the aim here was to start with the torso or trunk of the tree as shown by the SNPs and then add on the relevant STRs that help to show where the branches and the twigs are. There are also a lot of private STRs and SNPs in these branch lines, which are not shown here. And these are the leaves of the tree. But many of them may be pressed into service in the future as branch markers, as more people test, and we open up more of the genealogy. So, remembering how these Cummings were scattered through that list of Kemp and Jacobs matches, how does sorting the STRs using SNPs for the other surnames fit their trees together? Here's Kemp, and this family comes from Cavan, with one connected Kempton from Tyrone, all sharing a common ancestor, um, but one who is as yet unknown. Now the Kemp tree has less structure from either shared SNPs or shared STRs. Most of the markers shown here are private to each particular line, but the Y testing confirms that they are one genetic family. The time depth to the common ancestor is also unknown, but the lines seem to coalesce sometime around 1600-ish. The dotted lines show continuing doubt about how these lines fit into the tree. So recommended for this lineage is single testing of that question mark snip in the middle to pin down where it belongs in the tree, maybe another big Y in those unclear branches. The Jacobs tree is different again from the other two, as it depends more on genealogical knowledge. This group is fortunate to know the identity of their common ancestor, believed to be John Jacob, an indentured servant who pops up in Anne Arundel, Maryland around 1660, though they don't know where JJ came from before his first appearance there. There's been DNA testing of descendants of four of JJ's sons, yet there are still gaps to fill and NPEs to explain. Some lines attach somewhat shakily to JJ's sons. You can see the dotted lines here, and DNA can still help to resolve these. There is a possible big early parallel mutation about STRDYS570, which appears to be 18 in two of JJ's sons and mutated to 17 in another two. Is this two parallel mutations? Or is it a problem with the genealogy? And following a big Y test, four private SNPs now attach to one branch. We can see the green one, the green square there in the middle. Some of these will be shared Jacob SNPs, but which ones? 
So a big Y in another branch or selective SNP testing is now recommended to place these SNPs as branch markers. So there are three surname trees here. Does this mean that the SNPs have resolved the convergence? Well, yes they have. These three surname groups do have a common ancestor, marked by YP984, but a long time back, probably around 600 CE, or before the time of the Viking migrations. The negative results in the big Y tests are as important as the positive ones for sorting these convergent lines into their separate lineages. Since there is a common ancestor within approximately the last 1500 years, it's not really surprising that these haplotypes diverge from each other and then converge back together again, given the illusion they were more closely related than they are. This must have happened in many other surname lineages that seem closely connected from the STR test results they've done. So can we put all three surname groups onto a combined tree? Well here we are. Using the known SNPs now to differentiate the three lines before the STRs take over. There's a crude timeline on the right but we must stress the large margins of error here as the numbers of testers is still rather small. We can see here how the Cummings family is the oldest, and it looks as if it started its own spread before 1400, or not long into the surname era. The eventual Kemp and Jacobs lines split from each other probably around the same time, or a bit earlier, but each has a much more recent common ancestor of their own, from probably around the early or mid 1600s. Creating this tree has become possible only since the advent of NGS testing, especially the big Y, through which all of these SNPs have been discovered. And it's important to stress that this is still only a draft or a hypothetical tree. We've come a long way in just two years, but there's still a long way to go and many questions still to answer. So to finish up, Thanks are due to the many people who have helped with the thinking about how the SNP and STR results can be brought together and used to build more accurate trees. Some of them are here. And a very special thanks goes to all of the testers in the YP355 study group who have been open to sharing their results and data to help us all discover more about the origins of our surnames.